Um, we are amid yet another crisis together here, one now more, somewhat more familiar to us uh, in the environmental realms. And for those not in the Bay Area, we are once again having some pretty significant fires. So this evening's teachings are perfect as always for every crisis, but I would love us to um, go ahead and start off in the chat by just sharing what is here with us now? What's here at the level of interacting with relative reality uh, and the crises that are again with us, this time a new flavor. Some of you more familiar with the Dharma know that this term, how to practice when the world is on fire, it used to seem metaphorical. Um, and now it feels very, um, very much at home for those of us in California. So maybe get started with just a bit of, in the chat, what is being stirred up by this current crisis we are now finding ourselves in once again, amid an existing crisis and a many decades, hundreds of year long crises. So yeah, be curious from folks, what's already here as we go ahead and get started on our, our third night of Lojong. Diane is writing the chaos. Thank you. Stress and sorrow. Yeah. Disorientation, Eli, thank you. Sadness. Yeah. Thanks, Noam. So for those just joining, we are allowing ourselves a moment or two to arrive with everything that's here. And everything that's here, especially in related to um, the ever shifting, changing world of crises around us. Um, I notice for myself, this familiarity of this smoke, um, it brings a great sadness for me as well. Just knowing, um, that this smoke represents for many people, lost livelihood, lost homes, um, not to mention environmental destruction. It's, um, visibly seeing. What could be the worst day of someone's life? Uh, so that's definitely a feeling of heaviness. And tonight, I I almost think we should skip ahead in Lojong to Tonglen because wow, do we need it? And yet, I'm pretty sure the next week we're going to need it too. So we will keep on course with the Lojong training for this evening. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and get started with just a little introduction before practice. I am Eve Ekman, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Yes, truly. If you were ever curious about outer refuges and what they might offer, this time has been really good <laughs> to show you how unreliable they are. And I'm so grateful for this opportunity for us to practice our inner refuge. As long as we have power and internet, which again is uncertain, I'm so grateful we get to be together uh, and practice. So San Francisco Arm Collective, I am Eve Ekman. There are many of the wonderful board members and volunteers who make this center possible on this call. If you have your video on and you're so willing, just raise your hand. Hey, thank you volunteers, board members, we love you. So we are all the Dharma Collective and if you've been coming for a while or this is your first night, you are now the Dharma Collective. So as a volunteer run entity and organization, we truly are here for one another um, on this path, both as guides and spiritual friends. Um, I want to invite us, I, I put at the very top of the chat, I was for a while sharing a PowerPoint slide um, and that feels too jarring. 
to describe the qualities I invite us to engage in as citizens, participants, fellow travelers on the road here. So in our online community, as in our in-person community, we, you know, when we walk in the doors to a place, so interesting, it's like there's an entry and we're within it and we feel as though those walls, they kind of in some ways can speak to us and there's also an intentionality. We all showed up here for the same reason. So I think in this virtual space without any physical walls, it's even more important to be explicit. What, what brings us here? Why are we here? And what would we like to hold ourselves to? So I um, put here a couple of the paramitas or spiritual qualities that support us online. Even if you've heard them a million times, it's really nice to revisit and really consider that if we are here together engaging in the Dharma this evening, I really invite you to apply this paramita of discipline. And in that, we are having the discipline to be aware and keep in mind non-harming. Non-harming to ourselves. How gentle can we be if we accidentally unmute ourselves as we're coughing? Um, how gentle can we be to one another if someone else does that, right? How can we really live this discipline of non-harming in every thought, every action, every you know, even movement within the body? Um, we can just give that a try here together. Also, I really invite this quality of generosity. Allow yourself to fully be here. Um, I, like many of you, spend a lot of time online during the day. And I sometimes, um, there's colleagues on my call, I'm, I'm sorry already. Um, I confess that sometimes I'm doing more than one thing as I'm on a call. And you know, I don't need to tell you this, but the neuroscientific research shows us that divided attention is exhausting. It's exhausting. So give yourself the full generosity of showing up here, just here not also purchasing something online, not also halfway writing an email, not checking the weather, not checking the news, please give yourself a break. Give yourself a break, show up fully for yourself and everybody. And also, you know, I, I invite your patience. Um, it is a um, ongoing challenging time for all of us. We may notice kind of a uh, higher susceptibility of irritation these days. It's hard to feel kind of um, at ease and calm in the way we might like to. So to have some patience with yourself and one another as we kind of navigate these online worlds of being together in Sangha. And most importantly, I invite your joyful enthusiasm. We get to be here together with the teachings, together. How lucky are we? that these teachings have made it these thousands of years and that they are relevant, useful, that we have access to them. So more than anything, I really invite you here to this shared space um, to be in community and to be conscious in community um, and to show up with compassion and empathy. So that's my, my opening remarks. We're going to do one of my all time favorite practices this evening. Um, it's a practice that really goes quite well with the low John slogans we'll be covering. Um, for those of you who haven't been uh, joining us for a while, we are moving our way through the 59 slogans of low John, which are these traditional mind training slogans. And these are slogans that transform our mind through the very meditation upon and thinking about these ideas. You know, you hear an idea sometime and you're like, oh my God, I never heard that idea. It makes so much sense. And it even changes how you look at the world. Each of these are crafted for just that purpose on our path to awakening. So we're only on number five. <laughs> so if you are feeling like you've missed out, don't worry. Um, and they are all recorded. Um, so this evening, I hope we get through five and six. Uh, we'll definitely get through five. And tonight we're still on, um, even though there are 59 slogans, they really revolve around seven main points. Um, and this point that we're on now is really around uh, absolute bodhicitta, or really considering what does it take to have a fully open mind and heart. My yearning for that has never been stronger. I know how much it's needed for all of us and for everyone we're connected to. 
And so this evening we are going to practice in what does it mean to really be able to observe and undo all the ways our mind gets in the way of that bodhicitta. So how do we observe the actual space of our own mind? Because in that direct observation, it's as though it could in one instant kind of brush away as though kind of uh, blowing away dust off of gold. Like we would be able to see the true nature of our mind. So in order for us to know that, that even that gold might be there, we have to start knowing this nature of our mind. And that sounds esoteric. We'll unpack it with a lot of description and we'll start off by seeing what we can do experientially to really investigate the space of our own mind. We'll do a practice called the mindfulness of phenomena in which we essentially investigate all of our other sense portals, discovering what can be known there. What can we know through sound, through touch, through sight, through sensation, through taste, through smell, and then what can we know through mind? So that will be our first practice. I uh, hope you find it as refreshing as I do. Uh, I find it to be just such a beneficial practice, both for training and focusing our attention, applying inquiry, and getting these tiny glimpses of the spacious awareness of our mind. So without more hype, <laughs> let's go ahead. I, I know last week Chandra did a beautiful job of reminding us through the uh, posture points specifically. So let's remember those posture points. Let's be considerate of where our feet are either touching the ground or folded underneath us. Let's find our spine stacked as though those golden coins upright. Let's find a spaciousness and ease through the belly. Let's invite our hands and arms to be folded in a way that our shoulders don't feel too heavy. Have your gaze gently focused down. And find the crown of the head pointing with dignity upwards. The best posture that you can find is the posture which you don't need to move much, in which the natural quality of stillness can really flourish. So take a couple moments and really find the space and posture that will allow you a stillness throughout the practice. Feel or imagine as though that bell is saying softly to you, welcome home. Let's begin by settling the body into its natural state. First noticing how it feels to be in this body.
with curiosity and kindness, see if the body will naturally reveal its state. Without a need to move or shift around. With an invitation to fully arrive in this moment, we may find the body having the qualities of relaxation, ease, and stillness. Next, we find our way to settling the speech in its natural state. The inner dialogue and narration. We're often critiquing our own experience, imagining what's coming next. Let's just settle that by focusing on the natural rhythm of the breath. Letting our attention closely follow the breath as though it were the rider closely following the horse as it made its way through fields and forests. Following each contour of the inhale and the exhale. Then intentionally inviting ourselves to settle the mind. Releasing any grasping onto thoughts. Releasing distraction. Allowing the thoughts to be just as they are without energizing, without avoiding. And again, with curiosity, noticing if the natural quality of the mind may arise, its luminescence, its vividness, its clarity, even if we're tired or frustrated, is there a deeper water beneath those perturbations at the surface? And for a couple moments, allow yourself to continue to settle the body, speech, and mind into their natural states. 
following the breath in and out. And taking a moment here after this initial settling to find our motivation and intention for being here together this evening. This is possibly the most important part of the entire meditation. There's no way to get it wrong. Bring the full force of your attention and your compassion to what is the motivation to be here? What is your aspiration? What is your guiding light? And let that illuminate the body, mind and heart. And gently releasing this intention and aspiration, not pushing it away, just allowing it to absorb back into the field of mind, of body, and of heart. And we bring now our attention single pointedly to the sensations within the body. The pith instruction is in whatever can be felt, let it simply be felt without elaboration, without labeling, without preference. Noticing the sensations that may arise in the fingertips or the belly, around the face or the neck, with a simple curious noticing, as though it were the very first time we were noticing sensation in the body. Bring this full force of your attention to sensation. If you become distracted or caught up in thought, memory, or image, simply relax, release whatever has captured your attention, and return for a couple more breaths here, tethering your attention to the sensations that can be experienced throughout the entire field of the body.
And now completely shifting away from the sensations of the body. Engage through the sense portal of sound. In what is heard, let it simply be heard. But truly notice with curiosity and depth Sound as it arises, sound as it passes away, sounds that are steady and ongoing, sounds that are just coming briefly. Keep noticing sound without preference, without judgment, without labeling. And now shifting away from sound. Moving towards the more subtle sense portal of taste. Again, as though it were the first time and without preference or judgment, notice whatever can be noticed through the sense portal of taste. Notice whether the absence or subtlety of anything with flavor, how is that experience one in which we can still identify the sense portal of taste? And then shift to the sense portal of smell. As though the only way to know the world was through smell. What can be known here? Without preference, without judgment, notice the world through what can be smelled.
And now shifting to the sense portal of sight. Before you let your eyes slip open, imagine as though you were seeing for the very first time. And again, without judgment, without preference, notice whatever can be noticed through the visual field. In what is seen, let it simply be seen. Gently op opening the eyes, noticing colors and shapes, light and movement. Receive these visual impressions without leaning out towards them. Just noticing. Gently closing the eyes. And shifting now the full force of our attention to the greatest sense portal of our own mind. When we observe without preference, without judgment, the mind, we observe the thoughts and all other phenomena which arise in it, as well as the space in which they arise. Just as we notice the in-between of sounds or the absence of flavor, we notice the in-between of thoughts, the very space of the mind itself. Without engaging or energizing any of the thoughts, we simply watch them arise and watch them pass. If possible, don't even consider the thoughts are yours. They are just what's arising here. In the same way that the sounds coming from the outside are not your sounds, they're just sound.
remain open to the possibility of getting a glimpse of that gold of your mind. Unperturbed by ruminations and thoughts and projections. A simple luminous vividness Gently regather your attention into the body, grounding yourself into the breath as it can be noticed at the belly, gently rising and falling. Feel yourself fully in this body, supported by the ground. Thank you all for your practice. Hmm. Any questions or comments on practice? Um, of course, the chat is great, um, but also if you'd like to raise your hand. It's really important in this practice relating to the slogans we'll cover what it's like to try to investigate this space of the mind. Be curious, did anybody get a glimpse? Jenny, are you raising your hand? Yes. Great. It was so impossible because I'm sitting in my house, totally sealed off. It's a gazillion degrees, mm. and I can smell smoke even like right now. So my mind is racing, and I'm hearing everything you're saying. And I'm noticing that like, I have to have my shit together like 24 seven right now, because any number of my friends in fire zones might call me for help. Mm. So I have a, this like constant edge of on guard. So Lily was doing things like, it was just so intense because I could like totally be in touch with smell, totally be in, in touch with hearing. And I love these med I love when this happens and I can use my senses hmm. and just focus on any one of them. But it just kept coming back because 
of the smell of loss. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And that, um, that is where the mind is right now, right? So full of thoughts. And, you know, I, <laughs> um, it's interesting when we meditate in times of crisis and acute crisis, because we don't want to pretend as though we can put up blinders to the world. And yet we do need refuge and reprieve because this is an ongoing, um, we are being asked of the world, from the world for a lot. So how do, we, how do we refresh? And so if sound and if touch and if taste, if that was refuge, that is the place to be right now. That is the place to be, right? We, we actually need the proper kind of causes and conditions to arise for us to be able to relax into these, especially these space of mind meditations. Um, so it's, um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's really important to honor that. And I hope that there was some um, in the moment acceptance or compassion of even, wow, this is my mind right now. This is what it is. It's this swirling um, kind of um, conglomeration of very real threats and worry for myself and others. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, from Deborah, I see, I was intrigued by the suggestion that the thoughts in my mind were not my mind's thoughts any more than the sounds outside were mine. Yeah, that's a fun one, right? That is what we will a bit be digging into this evening of uh, resting in the nature of Alaya or resting in the nature of the essence. So um, I believe last week, those of you who attended with Chandra, she spoke a bit about, we use a process often in our meditations of analysis, of investigating. And then at some point we let go of analysis. At some point we let go of any doing uh, and we just rest. Though, of course, as Jenny points out, sometimes we can't rest. Sometimes we can't find that rest. Um, and so that, that's okay, right? That's, that's also great information for us. There's not a problem there. Um, but this idea of kind of unhooking our loyalty, our dedication to these thoughts as though they were truly who we are, as though they were truly ours. And they are ours, right? It's not, no one put them in our head. And yet they aren't connected as connected to reality as we think they are. So I, you know, I think it's, again, it's really hard in times of crisis to, um, to, you, you really have to be very specific and subtle about what these teachings mean. Some, some misinterpretation of the teachings could say, you're telling me that my own mind is the problem, that these fires don't matter, and that I am creating by my own thoughts the issue, and, and that's not it. And yet, even in a crisis, there are moments in which we can catch ourselves contributing to crisis thinking. Like wh whenever we have the opportunity to rest in the spaciousness of, of our mind, we must take advantage of it. However, for many of us, the kind of moment when we aren't doing something, we aren't going somewhere, we're not active, we let our mind completely take over with this unending kind of cascade of thoughts that we do attribute to be the true nature of reality. And that gets in the way for us. So, I'll move, I'll, move on to, um, I'll move on to the slogan in just one moment that really relates to why do we try to do these practices of resting the mind and awareness? Why? What's the purpose? That's not what life is, that's not what life is like. <laughs> why would we practice this? And one of the ideas is that when we are practicing this kind of uh, unconfigured mind, so the mind before we need to think about who I am and what I need to do, or who I am and how I should respond, the unconfigured mind, that resting there or finding small glimpses of that in our meditation, we can bring that into our life. We can enter a situation without already knowing, already assuming, having an idea, inserting our judgment, having a projection, right? Like the full blown <laughs> worldview that, um, you know, that it's already figured out for us. 
um, that there's nothing new. I, 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 you know, in teaching, knowing I was teaching this tonight, I tried to have a little unconfigured mind uh, just walking to the farmer's market. And I was just blown away. I probably looked like I was on drugs. Like I was like, oh my God, that tree. Who knew, right? You know, so there's a way that it can be playful. You know, it doesn't have to be um, so hard. And, you know, even this idea of inhabiting our own body, you know, inhabiting our, like, wow, this thing moves? And <laughs> this thing's so weird. Like, what is this, right? So just getting so curious without that attribution of, oh, my dry hair. God, I haven't had a, you know, a haircut since the pandemic, it's blah, blah, right? Just that, um, that freshness and newness of our own mind. God, such pliancy it provides for us. You know, we think of what is resilience? It's really, it's a pliancy. It's an, our ability to re, return to a baseline, but not just return to a baseline, even possibly exceed our prior baseline, right? That not just bounce back, but bounce better. And what allows us to do that is our natural capacity for our mind to heal and to heal itself and to improve itself. One of the most beautiful parts of the teaching of uh, both Dzogchen and then also this kind of awareness of mind practices that we're doing this evening is this idea that when we allow ourselves to kind of unhook or get disentangled from the perpetual cascade of thoughts, the mind heals itself. When we give our mind the space, when we are able to have that, the mind heals itself. That to me is, <laughs> it's so inspiring. Um, I so know that self, I know that to be true. Um, and yeah, I think, yeah, I think, um, I think, uh, I think it's a really beautiful aspiration for us. Uh, I just saw, uh, <clears throat> speaking of distraction, I just saw heal itself from what? Oh boy, um, that's such a beautiful question. And I hope that if you are asking it, that your mind is pretty um, peaceful. <laughs> um, the mind healing itself from jealousy, from aversion, from ignorance, um, and you know, from the patterns that we create. It's, it's not a problem for us to momentarily feel jealousy or momentarily feel aggression. It's that for many of us, these become a habit a mental habit, a way of being. So when I think of the mind that heals itself, I think of you know, our capacity for plasticity, for new pathways, new ways of thinking. Um, and again, it's, it's very hard to do, very hard to do. I'm tempted to talk about politics and I won't, but imagine how much we could, <clears throat> um, yeah, I reflect on the ways we might have stuck thinking right now and that kind of rigidity and way that our mind is looping. Okay, so I see also here from Claudia, a thought I've been hooked on arose. Uh, I was really reliving when you said that those thoughts were not our thoughts and it made me think of the dissolution of ego. Yes. Yeah, great, Claudia, that's great. Um, we're just, again, we're just, we're so loyal to these thoughts. They don't really like, that's not a great relationship. <laughs> you know, we're like loyal to the wrong, um, the wrong, it's not a person, but the wrong thing. And um, if we can start like investigating our loyalty, especially to these self-limiting thoughts and beliefs, right? That's it, right? The self-limiting ones. Are you raising your hand, Claudia? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I was uh, precisely thinking about that it was a, a, a thought that I've been attached to that is not particularly pleasant. And when whoever asked about healing, I just felt like that was it. It was, it was a thought that I wanted to let go of. Yeah. To really be freer, let go. I mean, something... I don't want to go into detail, but you know, yeah, really heal from that. Yeah. And so it just felt great when you reminded us like, you know, these thoughts are not your thoughts. And, and, and it yeah. just made me think about the whole thing about 
our own self and and Sogni Rinpoche when you were teaching us about like the spark and the precious ego uh, I and all yeah. of that and how you know we just like that's not it you know we yeah. have to let go so it was it, it was beautiful thank you that really oh, really helped me I'm so glad I'm so glad and you know um if when Claudia said that, you were like, oh man, I didn't get that. I don't know what that means. No problem. Um, you know, it's not just our meditation that give us that glimpse of freedom. We can have, you know, when you're in this like serious rumination. Um, I've been in, I've been, I've been in rumination recently and um, having a lot of tenderness. Um, some of you know I, I lost a dear family member in the last couple of weeks, and there's a lot. There's a lot of material there. And um I was deeply in rumination, even while out in nature yesterday and kind of still with these fears or um, projections. And then um, a whale came out of the water and opened its mouth like 15 feet away from me. And you know what? Ruminations, gone. There was no me, there was no other. It was just this flash. And I think I, I bring that up um, because we can also just notice when it naturally happens, when we are naturally free, when we actually are in an unconfigured mind and we're like, right, it's almost like a startle. It, it doesn't usually last very long, um, but we can at least know experientially what it's like to be free, what it is like to have that spaciousness. Um, yeah. Okay, so I see heal itself from what? Noam says, from conditioning, yes, all the conditioning, from blaming myself, yes. Um, heart, and then Donna says, it's hard to remember that the mind can be so unreliable um, versus engaging. Yeah, yeah, what an incredible feature our mind is, right? I, you know, I am so grateful we have this unbelievably imaginative capacity to know and recall our past to imagine and project into the future and yet wow um very tricky <laughs> very tricky as we all know yeah um really wonderful reflections on the practice and really moving us towards any any other questions or reflections on that before we move into the slogan Z, possibly okay great um so <clears throat> tonight the First slogan we're going to cover, again, this is in the uh, absolute bodhicitta. Um, and by absolute, it means it is our, um, our highest aspiration, right? So our relative bodhicitta is when I show up with the kind awakened heart and text my friend and say, gosh, I remember that you said you were going to have a really difficult meeting today. How did it go? That's my relative bodhicitta. It really matters. It is really wonderful. My absolute is every single being having a difficult encounter, my heart goes out to you. Irrespective of if you have harmed me, irrespective of if, you know, right? So these absolute levels are hard and they're aspirational, right? And the idea is that we can get this glimpse of how much freedom we would have if our mind wasn't so tied up in our preferences. I want my friend to have a good day. I want my friend to be okay through this difficult meeting instead of this more um, absolute or ultimate level. Um, so yeah, when we think about this um, slogan, this fifth slogan, rest in the nature of Alaya, it's essentially a method slogan. So not per se one in which we are just, um, not one in which we are just um, kind of repeating it into our own mind and, and letting that kind of resonate. We're actually trying out this practice of resting in this unconfigured state of mind. Um, so we actually think of this um, as a way in which we are not following thought, a way in which we are not caught up in thought rest in this nature, rest in this essence, rest in this alaya. Um, so what this serves the benefit of is it helps us see the construct that we make of our ego and our identity. 
when we rest in that nature, again, there's not the whole Eve story and show when I'm just walking down the street, experiencing the world as it is without my projection, without my uh, aversion and delusion. And, you know, it's interesting because I have heard this teaching many times. I'm sure you all, maybe many of you have of like, yeah, we have to see through this construct that we create. Um, and yet it's, even if there's a real deep understanding that many of us have, it can also kind of start to feel, we can, we can almost get a little bit um, too familiar with it. So I was provoking myself a little and preparing today to find a new way of looking at this idea. This idea that I've taught so many times of, you know, finding the spaciousness of mind, finding the formlessness or emptiness of our thoughts, of our beliefs. And so I turned to actually a, a, a sociology um, reference, one that I really enjoyed earlier in my academic studies. Um, and I often am talking about psychology, as some of you know, I uh, do contemplative social science and really love that work, but sociology is, is such a fascinating discipline. And for the sociologists here, I'm sorry, I will probably not do as well to your discipline as you could, but with sociology, we're studying the very construction of culture, the way in which we decide that, you know, um, this is a form of status or this is a form of loss or this actual ritual we do together is a good one and that one is not. With the sociology, we're studying how we create the culture and how we create our sense of self. So there's a, uh, a term or idea within sociology that's called the looking glass self. Some of you may be familiar with this. It's I think from, it's like very early, maybe 1920. Um, and Charles Horton Cooley is the reference. And he created and kind of wrote about this idea that um, the way we develop our sense of identity is through looking towards someone else to be a mirror of who we are. And this is simple, right? But it helps us see that there are more than one versions of our identity. So we might have the mirror identity of how our cat sees us, right? Hopefully really benevolent. We have the mirror identity of how our colleague or coworker sees us. We have the mirrored back identity of how our loved one sees us. Maybe we have the feedback of how our ex sees us, right? So there's all these different ways in which we are seen. And it's, we form our sense of self often through the way we perceive others see us. This is not news to any of you, but it's another way to remind ourselves that constructing a sense of fixed and solid self or fixed and solid anybody else, it's just, a, um, it's just untrue. <laughs> of course, right, like I am Eve, I, have done these things and I continue to be Eve tomorrow and, and that matters, right, for my job and for my relationships. But this idea that there is a single me is crazy. I am, you know, maybe even every one of you on the screen might see me in a different way. I might be a different person to all of you. And so when we look at the, this idea, what we're looking at is the idea of social construction, that our reality is not some sort of fixed reality. Our reality is something we co-create. And, you know, especially thinking of how we want to disassemble and decolonize a lot of the ways of thinking that have created so much harm in our country. It's actually really useful to think of how we can apply these kinds of theories and practices. How do we kind of, I wish it was possible to reprogram, not possible. How do we get a glimpse of what it's like to have freedom from our projections? So I went down a little bit on the rabbit hole with this one. Um, with Cooley, the way that he describes our looking glass self, he says that there's actually three elements there. It's the way that we imagine our appearance for the other person, the way that we imagine them having a judgment about it, and then our own kind of interpretation as it being good or bad, having pride or shame. 
So the levels of the mirror glass are, or the looking glass are, are layered. So not just, you know, how does that person think of me as though they were thinking of you? Like, you, I, I hope you've all had this realization occasionally when you've totally blown it in one way or another and you're like, everybody will know. And it's like, nobody cares. <laughs> nobody cares. You're projecting, right? And, and even if they care, they, there's no way they care as much as you often. Right, we're really overemphasizing the self. And to what end? To our own misery and feeling of insecurity. So it's a really interesting one. And when we think of this looking glass self, again, it's, it's, it's just us and other. We've created this binary, we've created this boundary. And he is talking about a sociological approach at a time, of course, I mean, it's still relevant now, but also he's talking about um, around the same time as we're constructing individuals to be a self, right? This, this, uh, this construction of self, we weren't always this self in the way that our current society and culture believes it to be. And unfortunately, it was a lot of the ways our self was created is in order to sell us stuff and make us a consumer. So it's a, not only a construction, a construction that is aimed, unfortunately, at um, not the most benevolent um, goals for us. So I think that this idea of really, um, again, applying different lenses to understanding what does it mean to have this idea that there is this unconfigured state, there is a place in our mind in which the thoughts aren't dominant, there is, in fact, nothing or nowhere to truly say, um, this is me, this is mine. It's a really interesting investigation. And again, today I was thinking of, um, in the handful of people I engaged with during my work day, how different they all see me and how none of them are real and true. And that this idea I have of myself so dependent upon that doesn't often make me very happy. There might be like temporary gains, right? Where I'm like, oh, I just said something smart. They probably think I'm good right now. But that's so easy to come and go, right? And so I think, when we want to find our way to investigating and more and more resting in this unconfigured state of mind, we have to have a motivation to do so. We have to have a real desire. So paying attention to the cost and to the consequence of our identity is, is hugely important. Um, one other piece on this is, you know, thinking about <clears throat> kind of the fallacy of our thoughts and thinking. Um, Alan Wallace has this term he uses that he created, which is the obsessive compulsional delusional disorder. That's not a DSM diagnosis. Um, he just talks about the way that we are obsessive in our thinking. We're compulsive in that we can't stop. We engage with it. It's completely delusional, the majority of it. And so that's what he calls his OCDD. That's his disorder. And um, he's, you know, one thing I, I wanted to point out is our cognition, our thinking, what we understand about it is there are so many errors. And so I was, again, a little bit down a rabbit hole, checking out all of the different ways we have biases, cognitive biases. And these biases are when we are inaccurate in our ability to see the world as it is. Right? We're inaccurate. And there's a lot of biases we're familiar with, implicit bias as it has to do with race, gender, um, sexual orientation. We know about those implicit biases. Many of us, we've read about it. But there's also these biases that are quite interesting um, that we, you know, the peak end, many of us are familiar with as well. At the end of our day or end of a certain um, episode of time, we remember what happened at the very end and also what was the most intense. That's our bias. We remember things that way. That's not reality. We treat it as though we're reality. So if I say, Jenny, you know, how was your day yesterday? What you'll remember is the thing that happened that was the most intense and at the end. So even the way that we look back on our life is not that accurate. So again, just trying to kind of uh, encourage us to question all appearances, right? Um, I also discovered that there is a bias called the Ikea effect that I just had to share with you all, which means, and this is studied, there's only one published paper on it. 
I don't know if it's reproducible, but that if you put together something like your own IKEA furniture, you're biased to think it's really good. Um, it's interesting. Uh, yeah. I haven't had that experience, <laughs> but maybe that happens for other people because you were involved, you're invested. So again, I think it's just, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting for us to see uh, that these ideas and these thoughts that we think are so true and so real, up for debate. Many of the ways we feel so certain about how the world is. Um, yeah, and there's also, there's even, sorry, there's a bias blind spot. We think we are less biased than other people. That is like a commonly well-studied phenomena. Um, and then we also have this attribution error. We always, when someone does something that we can, you know, we think is wrong or bad, we associate it with their personality. But when we do something wrong or bad, it was a mistake. So like, like, it's really interesting to get curious about these ways that we are fundamentally um, over, over um, investing in what we think and how we think and under investing in some ways um, around what is this unconditioned state of mind. Okay, I'm gonna, there it looks like yeah, um, Diane, thank you for sharing those. It's such a wonderful resource, by the way. I was checking those out. There's a number of teachers there, Alan Wallace, Shogyam Trumpa, Pema. Um, it's really great. Um, so was that why? Okay. Da, 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 da. Is that why Sangha is always at night? I don't get it. Peak, oh, peak end theory, that's right. Because it's the last thing. Yep, so obviously it's gonna be really wonderful. Um, so what I would love before we move on to the next slogan, again, I think it's really important for us to wrap our mind around these slogans, to not just take them in. Um, so this slogan, which is, <clears throat> Rest in the nature of alaya, the essence. Um, alaya being this unconfigured state of mind, this luminous bliss, or not always bliss, but this spacious unconfigured mind. I'd be curious to hear from you all reflections on what do you believe and how do you get stuck in those beliefs? What prevents you from resting in this alaya? And it doesn't have to be the one thing but just to kind of get ourselves thoughtful about what are the kinds of things. The belief that I need to do something, Katie, yeah. Yeah. Yes, Sylvia. Regina, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, lately, and maybe because the pandemic, and because I'm in my house most of the time, and I'm thinking very differently. I, I don't know. I, I, I feel myself very different from where it, when it started to mm -hmm. now. And one of the things is that almost everything has gone away. It's like, really, now I can realize how nothing exists hmm. except, except the moment, the now. All the titles and all the things that one works for them, to have them, to, to get dressed with them, to, to, to show to the others who we are and what we think and and that's going to give us the opportunity to think more and to go deeper and become more intelligent and more knowledgeable and all of that suddenly who cares <laughs> <laughs> i mean here we are afraid even we don't know it we are and 
you know, I, for the first time in my life, I can see the street and people passing by because everywhere where I've lived, it was up there and I couldn't see the people walking in the street like now I can see them. That's so strange for me. But I see them and they are covered to, he, to here until, and, and then also with caps for the sun and walking and walking. And I, I'm thinking every scent of personality that we used to have, we don't have it anymore. I mean, people used to smile at me, with me, not at me, with me. And nobody smiles at me anymore. So that makes me very sad. And mm -hmm. also the idea that nothing was true. Mm -hmm. I mean, I worked so, so much to be somebody and it wasn't, it is nothing. Mm. I finished there. <laughs> and does that feel, does that feel sad or does that feel something else? That feels now that I'm really looking at the reality of, of life. It means we are here and tomorrow we're not here mm. and your mother left and my mother left before and my father, I had a family. I don't have a family anymore. Mm. And so that's, that's uh, the passing of, the, of time. It's the only thing that I can see now, mm. like with, without my intervention. Mm. Wow. I bow down to that observation. Thank you for sharing. Oh. Thank you. you. Seriously, yeah, really very powerful. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I agree with you um, in going through all of my mom's belongings these last couple of weeks. Um, of course, I recognize and see all the things, they're just things, right? They're not the person, they don't, they don't, um, they don't come with us. Um, and that's why, you know, our preliminary practices two weeks ago are remembering impermanence, remembering impermanence, um, not as a morbid way, but just as you exemplify to see that it's just this moment. And it's okay. Like things are cool, but we, we can get, we can pretty much occupy our entire life trying to make samsara more comfortable. And it's almost possible, right? If I just get that and then this and then that other comfortable thing and we miss out, we miss out on being able to know truly this beautiful state of our unconditioned mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Joe wrote. Uh, okay, Diane wrote, or, or Donna wrote, doubt I would be able to recognize the unconfigured mind. I bet you've seen it, Donna. I bet you've seen it. You know, it's really, sometimes it's right when we first wake up, before we have that, you know, whatever thought it is, hopefully a nice one of what a beautiful day, or oh my God, <laughs> what's happening? Um, it's, it's there, and it's not, again, it's, it's not mystical. It requires no belief. It's just that simple, plain way. And sometimes we just forget to have to remember who we are, right? We've been whatever it is, you know, um, I found that when I worked in um, the emergency room at San Francisco General as a social worker, and it was very high intensity work. Um, and sometimes the shifts would be really dense with people in need and suffering. I would sometimes forget that I was Eve. Do, I, like, I was just so in, and that's not the flow state per se, but truly like a, a selfless sense of presence. Um, and so I think we can find it in more ways than just meditation. Um, and I think in meditation, it's, it's not a, a, a place or a state, but it's a quality of mind. That makes any sense. There are some somatic markers that I think probably are different for everybody. For me, 
I definitely feel something in the back of my head. I don't know if folks get that sensation um, when I'm more kind of dropped into this unconfigured state. Um, okay, and then Diane says, the constant stream of, uncon of conditioned thoughts catapulting me out of the present moment. Yeah, absolutely. That's a huge um, obstacle for us. Um, and, you know, moment by moment or giving ourselves space and rest. Um, it's unbelievable even, I don't know, it is not possible for everybody, but occasionally during the week I have, a, I have an hour before I start work that I get to just be me um, and taking a walk or sitting or um, reading or writing. And it doesn't take that much time to reconnect to who we are. Uh, the morning is often for most of us a little easier in that we're fresh um, and we've had some time. Um, okay, so Joe says, in meditation particularly, the belief that I need to guard inwardly against the intrusions of the external world to feel peace of mind <laughs> enough for spaciousness and the belief that negative emotional reactions to things I hear or notice outwardly are blameworthy and signs that I'm doing a meditation wrong. Wow, so beautifully described. So many second arrows there, right? Of uh, just that feeling of adding additional suffering to our challenge and difficulty. It's really hard for us to not get um, caught up in practice um, and an idea of how it should be for us. You know, um, I do think almost always in when we are having that kind of agitation, relaxation, relaxation, through the exhale, giving ourselves a space, a reset. Um, that moment of agitation might be far closer than our moment of opening than we imagine. It's not necessarily that in order for us to reach that vast spaciousness we might be looking for, we have to have, you know, all the right candles and the right sound and the, you know, um, occasionally we, we just find it even after a lot of challenge and difficulty. So thank you, Joe. Um, <laughs> um, okay. And Walt says, perceptions of who we are, what is and what is true have disappeared in public discourse and makes me afraid regarding the future of representative democracy. Truth is what demagoguery convinces us is true. Personally, the four truths and eightfold path are anchors though. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that paradox <laughs> of, um, yeah. Yeah, it is, it is a real challenge to have, um, a desire to not get stuck and anchored in any idea of truth. And yet then, you know, the representative democracy, I'm not sure I quite understand that, but I would really like to. Um, Post-truth problems. Yes, that's right. Um, it's like a McIntyre concept, right? I think that's what Walt was talking about. One more time. I'm sorry. No, please, please say, Joe. Yeah. There's, there's a nice book called Post Truth by a guy named McIntyre, and I, I think that's kind of what Walt was talking about, but I don't want to speak for Walt. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you tell me what that means? I would love to know uh, and your understanding of it. Uh, Walt, do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure um, uh, because I'm unfamiliar with uh, the McIntyre book, but. Um, uh, what I was trying to uh, relate is that, um, you know, especially in the time of uh, COVID and so many other uh, problems that, that have come um, to the fore uh, recently, and with the president who we happen to have, um, I've, the this, this system that we have, um, as good or bad as it is, in representative democracy requires, I think, some uh, general public um, uh, acceptance or agreement as to what is true. Right. And you say, this is true. Now, I may disagree with you 
in terms of how to address this truth, which is, you know, a problem or an issue, but we say this is an issue. We agree. Yeah. We disagree on how to resolve it. But when with the kind of situation that, that seems to have developed uh, in this country and for that matter, in a number of other mm. uh, liberal democracies, it's like, I don't have to accept your truth. Right. I have my truth. You have your truth. Um, racists have their truth. Sexists have their truth. Yes. And if you have no ability to have some common acceptance of what is true, what is real, then it's going to fall apart. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for explaining. Um, yeah. Our, our common humanity as a basic truth, right? Or some shared civic code of ethics as some truth. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, slightly tangential, yet so important because we're talking about it. My, um, my dad, some of you know, is a, is a well-known researcher and psychologist, and one of his fields of expertise is in deception. And it's interesting about lying and truth is it's not a lie if you believe it. And I think when I hear you speaking, I hear, you know, unfortunately we do have someone who um, is leading our country with lies that they believe as truth. So that is a, um, and it's, it is an interesting paradox against this idea that there is no fixed reality in the Aliyah, right? Um, and I think the idea, it's so, it's so challenging and it's, it is such a beautiful and rich territory for um, the kind of Western scientific point of view. Uh, when we, and even within Western science, there's been a very important crisis of reproducibility where, especially in psychology, for example, we see that many of these ideas we hold to be true about humans and human nature have been proven in one study, but wouldn't be proven again. And so then what we're pointing to not as bad science, but that actually there is a little bit more flexibility, but that's a slippery slope when of course, the issues of truth we're talking about relate to how human beings are treated and how we deal with a medical crisis. Um, and so I, I really appreciate bringing this to earth because um, I do think we can actually apply this wisdom of the unconfigured mind to how we approach problems. If we are with our preconceived idea that we know what is true, we're actually going to be unavailable for the truth that is evolving over time. That's, you know, my, my, um, my reflection on that really meaningful, um, yeah invitation for inflection. Did I see another hand up there? I'm so appreciating you all this evening and your wisdom. Um, this is really, there's nothing more important um, than really trying to understand not only these amazing teachings, how do they actually influence us in this time when we're at home during the pandemic wondering what all the things we like, accumulated in life mean, or when we're trying to understand how does this apply to the relative reality of our democracy. Um, yeah, I think <clears throat> the common shared civic code of ethics is, is still, um, it's so important, whether we're approaching that from the point of view of um, Buddhist practice or from our kind of neurobiology, we recognize that there are certain things that we feel good about, that we are drawn to as part of humanity. And luckily, that is kindness and sharing. Of course, there's aggression. That's also part of who we are. But if we look at the full truth of our humanity, we see that we do not survive without cooperation. We do not survive without collaboration. It's fundamental. Um, yeah. Yeah, so much unfolding. Um, okay, I'm gonna look here, da -da 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 -da. ideology, yay for ethics as part of the path, 
Noam, ideology as hyper-conditioned mind. Yeah. So fixed, right? Such a fixed uh, re-going over and over of the same ideas. My truth, your truth, their truth, and never the twain shall meet. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's often the case. Yeah. Ooh, I'm so tempted to add in just our very last um, um, slogan for the night. I'll tell Chandra that she can, we can follow up on it. But I really, this one, it hits me at a level of, um, I would just say romance. Like I actually feel kind of in love with it. It feels so beautiful to me. It's just, it's so softening. Um, this is the slogan in post meditation. Be a child of illusion. And that really means that it's part, it's this like kind of last part of our absolute bodhicitta. Um, next week we move on to the relative bodhicitta of Tonglen. It's when we are emerging from our meditation state, see if we can hold even the simplest feeling, sense, or understanding that the world isn't as conditioned as we feel it is. And having this kind of, you know, I, I don't know about you all, but sometimes I am fitting in my meditation and I'm done and I get up and I go and I'm, it's the next thing. This really invites us, this slogan, to start extending the insights and the ethics and the intentions of our meditations immediately after and as we're, as we're transitioning to whatever it is we do next. Just such a sweet and simple thing to do for ourselves. In a talk uh, Alan Wallace gave, or actually, sorry, in a book Alan Wallace wrote, he says that we should treat the time after our meditation as though we were recovering from a concussive state. So after we have a concussion, we aren't running around and doing this and that, like we're so gentle. We have to be gentle. We don't expose ourselves to really intense things, you know, so this post-concussive state, to be gentle with our mind state following meditation. Um, so with that, I'm going to bring us into our dedication so that we can all be children of illusion together for the rest of the evening. So come home to the body, come home to the mind. Come home into the heart. And for even this brief moment, consider this body, mind, and heart could be completely fresh and new. Feel or imagine the quality of luminosity in the mind, openness in the heart, presence in the body. And from our simple humanity, let's dedicate our practice time here together and considering that if any of the conversation, reflection, and community building is of benefit, that it might extend and expand as widely as possible so that all beings would know the true causes and conditions of their own happiness. So that all beings would feel belonging and connection with all other beings. So that all beings would be free. So let's be like children of illusion, 
bringing forth any of the qualities of our meditation to the rest of our night. Being soft and gentle. Being open to questioning the very root of our thoughts and perceptions right as they arise. So appreciate being with you all. Thank you so much. Next week, more Lojong. And as always, we appreciate your generosity to support the center and teachers. And as always, there's an outrageous schedule of amazing teachings. Please check it out. Yeah. Thank you, Eve. You're so welcome. Thank you. Night. Thank you for this. Thanks so much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You gave us so much. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Good night. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you all. It was amazing. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, powerful. Thank you.